Hello everyone, and welcome to War in Middle-Earth, a series where I take you through all of the major wars and conflicts throughout the history of Middle-Earth, from the First Age to the Fourth Age. In this episode, we look at the Battle of the Moranon, and the battles that followed that would see the end of Sauron's dominion. With one final roll of the dice, the captains of the West would risk everything in hope that Frodo would succeed in getting the One Ring to Mount Doom. In the previous episode, we looked at the war in the north, where Sauron would launch attacks against Rohan, the Woodland Realm, Erebor and Dale, and multiple attacks against Lothlorien. Except for a final attack on Lothlorien on the 22nd of March, this theatre has largely calmed down by the 18th, with all of Sauron's attacks having met failure, except for the attack on Erebor and Dale. But even as fighting in the north quietens down, a new offensive begins in the south on the 18th, and this time, it's not Sauron who was attacking. On the 15th, the Battle of Pelennor Fields was fought outside the gates of Minas Tirith, and it ends in victory for the Free Peoples. Although the forces of Gondor and Rohan have taken heavy losses, probably around 5,000 men since fighting began at Osgiliath, they have succeeded in destroying the Morgul host and ending the Corsair and Haradrim invasion of Gondor's southern fiefdoms. For the moment, Gondor is safe, and a large part of that is thanks to the efforts of Aragorn. Speaking of Aragorn, this is the moment he has been waiting for for many years, a heroic return to Minas Tirith where he would claim the throne of Gondor. However, Aragorn has no intention of formally claiming the throne right away. No, that would wait until after Sauron was defeated. In fact, he doesn't even want to enter the city in a formal capacity, but relents and enters in secret, working at the Houses of Healing after the battle and through into the next morning. By doing this, he saves the lives of Faramir and Eowyn, who have been heavily afflicted by the Black Breath, as well as mending the hurts of Merry and many others. Truly, isn't Aragorn just the perfect man? There's little time for rest, though. The next day, Aragorn calls a council outside the city for the Captains of the West, the Last Debate. Known attendants of this council are Aragorn, Gandalf, Eomer, the new King of Rohan, Prince Imrahil, who is acting as Gondor's ruler whilst Faramir recovers, and the sons of Elrond, Elrahir and Eladan. Gandalf begins the council by explaining a harsh yet necessary truth that had shown itself in Denethor's Palantir. Sauron has become far too powerful to be defeated by strength of arms alone, and that the free people's hopes must be placed in the Ringbearer. Thus, Gandalf proposes that Aragorn leads an army to Mordor, and although it won't be able to help Frodo directly, it could draw Sauron's attention and give Frodo a better chance. He points out that Sauron has no idea about Frodo or his quest, and that if Aragorn marches on Mordor, which surely no sane man would do, then Sauron will wrongfully assume that Aragorn has the One Ring and will throw everything at him in a bid to take it back. It's a bleak suggestion, and Gandalf points out that even if Frodo is successful, it's possible that they will be overwhelmed in the field and killed, not living to see a brighter dawn. After a lengthy silence, Aragorn decides to heed Gandalf's advice, but tells everyone present that he will command no man, and that anyone who follows him should do so out of their own free will. The Sons of Elrond are the first to pledge to follow, stating that their father sent them south for this very purpose, Next is Eomer, who considers Aragorn to be a trusted friend, and says that just as Aragorn aided his people, he shall aid him. Prince Imrahil also pledges his loyalty, stating that he regards Aragorn as his liege lord, and will do as he commands. However, as acting steward of Gondor, he also states his concerns about Minas Tirith, and does not want to leave the city undefended. He is also concerned about Mordor's blocking force in Anorion, which was unfought and is still intact. With a course of action having been decided, the Captains of the West get to work on the logistics. Gandalf counsels that Gondor does not need to be left undefended, and that the force that marches on Mordor only needs to be big enough to catch Sauron's attention. However large that force is, Gandalf also advises that it should leave no more than two days from now, on the 18th, which will give a little time for men to rest and recover. Eomer informs Gandalf that if they must leave in two days, then he can lead no more than 2,000 and leave as many behind as defence for the city. But Aragorn is more optimistic, pointing out that reinforcements were en route from the south, 4,000 led by Angbol, Lord of Lamadon, and more ships that had followed Aragorn up the Anduin were arriving by the hour. He judges that they could march on Mordor with 7,000 and leave the city better defended than when the assault on Gondor began. 
The debate then ends, and the captains of the West get to work gathering the forces necessary to march on Mordor. Aragorn personally rallies 2,000 from those men who had accompanied him or followed him through the south. Prince Imrahil gathers 3,000 from amongst the city's garrison, survivors of Mordor's onslaught and the Battle of Pelennor Fields, including Pippin and Baragond. Eomer puts forth 500 of his best riders, as well as another 500 on foot who had been unhorsed yet uninjured during the battle. The last 500 is an elite group. The finest of Gondor's cavalry, including the prestigious Swan Knights of Dol Amroth and what remains of the Grey Company. All in all, the host of the West amounts to 7,000, 6,000 on foot, and 1,000 cavalry. And as Prince Imrahil points out, scarcely the size of Gondor's vanguard in the days of its power. As for the rest of the Rohirrim who survived the battle, about 3,000 in total, they are sent north under Elfhelm to deal with Mordor's forces in Anorian. On the 18th, the army is assembled on the Pelennor. There's hopeful news all round. Aragorn's scouts have returned, informing him that Osgiliath and the lands up to the crossroads are empty of foes. There's also been a victory in the north. Sauron's forces in Anorian, already in retreat after hearing of the defeat at the Pelennor, shatter and flee into Ka Andros when Elfhelm attacks them. From the south, Angbor's forces are nearing the city. With nothing else left to do, Aragorn orders the host of the west forward towards Mordor. By the afternoon, the army reaches Osgiliath. There, workers and craftsmen have already gotten to work to repairing or strengthening the bridges and ferries that cross the Anduin, as well as gathering supplies for the war. Some brave few have even crossed the river and have begun throwing up defences in the eastern half of the city. The host of the west passes through the city, continuing on for another five miles and eventually making camp just beyond the city's limits. However, the cavalry rides on, coming to the crossroads at around evening. Here, Aragorn orders his trumpeters to play, and heralds shout that the lords of Gondor have returned to reclaim their old lands, dispelling the eerie quiet. That night, at the crossroads, the captains of the west have another debate. What to do about the nearby city of Minas Morgul? Some, including Imrahil, suggest that the city should be taken and destroyed, and that the host of the west should then attack through the Nameless Pass into Mordor, believing it to be an easier route. Gandalf quickly shuts down these suggestions, stating that the evil and horror of Imlad Morgul will drive the men insane. He also points out that Faramir had learned Frodo was attempting to take the Pass of Kiref Ungol, and that attacking from that direction would have the consequence of drawing Sauron's attention towards Frodo, rendering the whole expedition pointless. The next day, the 19th of March, the rest of the army reaches the crossroads, and Aragorn orders defences be built upon the crossroads with the dual purpose of watching Minas Morgul, as well as watching the southern road towards Harad. Manning these defences would be several hundred archers, mostly men who were familiar with Athelion. Wishing to take extra steps to defend against any terror that might remain in Minas Morgul, Aragorn rides to the entrance of Imlad Morgul alongside Gandalf and a company of soldiers. There, they break the bridge over the Morgulduin, and they set fire to the fields outside the city before departing. On the 20th, the host of the west begins their journey northwards. They continue to loudly announce their presence, riding openly upon the road and blowing blasts from their trumpets every so often, proclaiming that the lords of Gondor are come. This eventually changes to King Elessar has come, on the insistence of Prince Imrahil. Despite their appearance of being unfazed, scout companies continue to ride ahead, accompanied by the rangers of Aphelion, led by Mablung. Thanks to these rangers, it's discovered late on the 21st that a force of orcs and easterlings have prepared an ambush further up the road. Ironically, in the exact same place that Faramir had ambushed the Haradrim almost two weeks earlier. Thus, the ambushes become the ambushed when Aragorn sends his cavalry westward, and they sweep in behind the orcs and easterlings, easily defeating them and driving them into the eastern hills of Ethel Duath. This victory does little to enhearten the host of the west. Every footstep they take brings them closer to their possible doom in the blasted lands of Mordor, and from the night of the 21st onwards, the Nazgul fly overhead, out of sight to everyone except for Legolas, but their presence can be felt. Aragorn himself believes the ambush to have been little more than a feint, a sacrifice by Sauron to embolden the captains of the west into believing that Sauron was now weak. On the 23rd, the same day Frodo and Sam are crossing the Gorgoroth, the host of the west reaches the northern limits of Aphelion. 
Beyond is the ancient battleground of Dagalad, blasted and lifeless, so desolate that the army halts in fear, never having seen anything so horrific. Some of the men refuse to go any further, and instead of being angry, Aragorn takes pity on them. Many of them are merely farmers from the Westfold or Lossanach, usually peaceful lands where Mordor was a mere tale used to scare children. Thus, Aragorn tells them that if they cannot go any further, then they should still retain some of their honour and instead take back Cat Andros. Some ashamed by his mercy, harden their hearts and decide to continue onwards, but most of them turn back, set on a new goal within their measure. Given that Gondorian boats are later seen moored outside of Cat Andros, it appears that these men do succeed in their mission of taking back the fortress. With the departure of those of Fainter Heart, and the earlier garrisoning of those men at the crossroads, the host of the west crosses onto the Dagolad with a little less than 6,000 men. The advance now becomes much slower, and Aragorn no longer sends out scouts, fearing to lose men to whatever lurks in the hills adjacent to the Moranon. Instead of following the bend in the road, Aragorn continues marching northwards, planning on approaching the Black Gate from the northwest to avoid the same mistake Onderher made during the infamous disaster at the Moranon over a thousand years earlier. On the night of the 24th, the host of the West makes camp for the last time. The air is still, the moon is shrouded by fumes from Mordor, the wolves are howling and the watchers can see creatures moving in the night. Dawn brings a chill breeze from the north and in the grey light of the morning, the host of the West arrays itself before the Black Gate. The time has come for the final act of the play. All is silent. There are no enemies to be seen, except for the Nazgul flying overhead, yet Aragorn is aware that hidden enemies await in the hills. He rides forth to the Black Gate with his captains, and they demand that Sauron should come forth and face justice. The Black Gate opens, but instead of Sauron, out comes a man and a company of horsemen behind him. This is the mouth of Sauron, the Lieutenant of Barad-dûr, a black Numenorian who entered Sauron's service when he returned to Mordor. The discourse begins as expected, with the mouth of Sauron insulting Aragorn and his lineage. He then turns his attention to Gandalf, insulting him as well, and then presents items of great importance. Frodo's mithril coat, his grey cloak from Lorien, and Sam's sword. To those assembled, they believe this is the moment that seals their fate. Frodo has been captured and the One Ring returned to Sauron. Even Gandalf cannot hide his dismay. The mouth of Sauron continues on, informing them that the fate of the prisoner depends on whether they accept the following terms. This isn't verbatim, but you'll get the idea. Gondor and its allies will take oaths to never assail Sauron again, and they will withdraw beyond the Anduin. All lands east of the Anduin will be under Sauron's dominion forever. All lands west of the Anduin up until the Misty Mountains and the Gap of Rohan will become tributary to Sauron. They will bear no weapons but will have leave to govern their own affairs. They shall also help rebuild Isengard, and there Sauron's lieutenant shall dwell as an overseer of the western lands. It's clear from the way that the mouth of Sauron speaks that he intends on being this tyrant. These terms might seem somewhat generous when faced with imminent destruction, but Sauron isn't known as the deceiver for nothing. He cannot be trusted. Gandalf utterly rejects these terms, stuns the mouth of Sauron with a flash of light, and takes back Frodo's belongings. The mouth of Sauron is speechless and then rides away in rage. His company of horsemen follow him. One thing to note is that the mouth of Sauron only ever mentions a single prisoner and refers to them as a spy. He does not mention anything about the One Ring, nor is there any evidence as of yet that Sauron actually has it in his possession. The captains have little time to ponder this, and the moment the mouth of Sauron gallops away, horns blow from the Moranon, and the hills explode with activity. The Black Gate swings completely open and outpours the armies of Mordor. Orcs stream down from the hills on either side of the Towers of Teeth, and clouds of dust begin to rise from the east. An army of Easterlings, hidden in the foothills of the Ered Lifui, emerges. The captains of the west retreat to their own lines and prepare for the onslaught. Aragorn has little time to prepare his order of battle. The host of the west has taken up position on two large slag hills, surrounded by a mire of mud and foul-smelling pools, acting like a moat. 
Aragorn's standard, the tree and stars, is raised upon one hill, and upon the other, the white horse of Rohan and the silver swan of Dol Amroth. Around both hills is a ring of spearmen and swordsmen, and above them stand the archers. In the direction facing Mordor, Aragorn places his most elite soldiers, the sons of Elrond, the Dúnedain, Prince Imrahil, Swan Knights, and the elite men of the Tower of Guard, and Pippin. It truly is a nightmarish sight. Despite being the morning, the rising sun is shrouded by the fumes of Mordor, and it casts the battlefield in an angry red light, as if it were the end of the world. Overhead, the Nazgul gather, and begin their descent. Before the battle even begins, morale is wavering. For example, Pippin is glad to find himself in the front rank, simply because it will mean that his death will come sooner rather than later, when all hope has truly gone. He finds himself finally understanding the words of Denethor, even as he was consumed by fire. The first assault begins. The orcs are hindered by arrows and by the mires that lay before the hills, so they hang back and fire their own arrows. But the hill trolls from Gorgoroth, bearing heavy hammers and round bucklers, easily wade through the mud and crash into the front ranks of the Gondorians. Beragond of the Tower Guard is stunned by a blow and falls to the ground. When a troll reaches down to tear out his throat, Pippin stabs it with his sword, driving deep into its vitals. The troll falls atop Pippin, crushing him underneath, and he slips into unconsciousness. He hears men yelling a single phrase. The eagles are coming. Atop a hill, Aragorn and Gandalf watch the battle. Surrounded on all sides, the host of the west is being swiftly hemmed in and forced back, and hope is swiftly fading. But just as Pippin heard, Gandalf sees. Why are here the Windlord, Landreval his brother, and many eagles of the north swiftly descend down towards the battlefield. The Nazgul on their fell beasts turn, and suddenly they flee. At this moment, Frodo Baggins, the ring bearer, claims the One Ring for himself, alerting Sauron to his presence. Sauron realizes the ploy, and the Nazgul speed towards Mount Doom. With his attention focused elsewhere, the hosts of Mordor momentarily waver, unaware of the situation that is unfolding in Samoth Nawa. Gollum and Frodo fight over possession of the ring, with Gollum being the victor. Yet in the moment of his triumph, he slips, and he falls. The One Ring plunges into the depths of the mountain, and is destroyed. The earth shakes, Mount Doom roars and unleashes its fire. Lightning fills the heavens and black rain begins to pour. In the heart of Mordor, Barad-dur begins to crumble, grinding into dust. The Towers of Teeth, Narcos and Karkos, sway and then collapse to the ground, ruining the Black Gate in the process. Above it all, a huge dark shape of impenetrable darkness crowned in lightning, rises above the ruins of Mordor, and reaches out a dark hand towards the host of the west. But as quickly as it rises, a gust of wind blows it away. Sauron, the greatest of foes since the end of the First Age, has finally been defeated, for good. On the battlefield, the hosts of Mordor scatter. They were held together by the will of Sauron, and his destruction breaks them. Orcs, trolls, and other fell creatures run this way and that, some mindlessly, others back to their holes in the hills, and others fall on their swords or throw themselves into pits. The Nazgul are caught in the fiery ruin of the mountain, and fall into oblivion along with their master. Most of the Easterlings and the Haradrim flee eastwards, but a few, those deepest in the service of Sauron, gather themselves for a last stand. After the battle is over, many of those Gondorians and Rohirrim still capable of fighting, venture into Mordor itself, and get to work destroying Sauron's fortresses in the north of that land. Not all remain to finish the fight. Gandalf rides Gwyahir to Mount Doom in the company of Landreval and Meneldor, and together they rescue Frodo and Sam from the fire that is spewing forth from the ruin of the volcano. By the time Frodo and Sam awaken in Athelion on the 8th of April, the last remnants of Sauron's power has been destroyed. On the 27th of March, merely two days after Sauron's destruction, the Easterlings besieging Erebor receive news of the catastrophic defeat. Dismayed by the defeat of their god king, and now without true purpose or direction, the army begins to waver. King Bard II and King Thorin III Stonehelm notice the crumbling morale of the Easterlings, and they sally forth that day, defeating the Easterlings and driving them out of Dale and away from Erebor. The following day, the 28th, Celeborn leads the Lothlorien Elves, victorious in three battles against Sauron, across the Anduin in many boats. Having expended its power on what ultimately proved to be pointless attacks, Dol Guldur is not heavily defended, and the Lothlorien Elves are able to capture the fortress. 
There, Galadriel proves the true extent of her power, and she throws down Dol Guldor's walls and lays bare its pits. This is without her Ring of Power, by the way. It's been rendered useless by the One Ring's destruction. With Dol Guldor's complete and utter destruction, the cleansing of Mirkwood could truly begin. Sauron's final defeat cannot be overstated. For thousands of years, he served as the chief enemy of all the Free Peoples, and before that, he served as the lieutenant of an even greater evil. The Dark Lord of Mordor was responsible for immeasurable cruelty and destruction, and the blood of millions was on his hands, not just in the west, but in the east, south, and the north. The damage he did to the world would never truly be undone, and that which could be fixed would take centuries or even millennia. But for most of the Free Peoples of Middle-earth, the war is over, and the new ordering of the lands in the coming Dominion of Men would be the next thing on their minds. But the War of the Ring has not yet ended, and for some, it is now only truly beginning. A fallen enemy fought to be defeated makes one final desperate, pathetic ploy for power, and he does it in the one place that has mostly been untouched by war. Before we reach the epic conclusion of this series, there is one more battle to cover, the Battle of Bywater. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. Sorry if the ending was a bit abrupt. There will be an epilogue episode where I cover everything that happens after the War of the Ring and the fate of our favourite characters and places, but I felt it would be easier to cover the Battle of Bywater first, an oft forgotten part of the tale. Cheers, thanks, farewell, and remember, if your Dark Lord is dead, it's not the end of the world. Use it as an opportunity to reinvent yourself.